Section 1 of Tales from the Works of G. A. Henty. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Paul Nelson. Tales from the Works of G. A. Henty by G. A. Henty. The Mate Story from The Plague Ship by kind permission of the Society for Promoting Christian Knowledge. Mr. Thompson, at one time second mate of the whaling ship The Two Brothers, was telling his three nieces the story of his last voyage in that ship. At Singapore, on her way home from the South Seas, she had taken on board as passengers a Mr. Williams and his wife and daughter. Mr. Williams had been working for twenty years among the Papuans as missionary. On the homeward voyage, they had been blown down by a hurricane among the Malay Islands, and had been attacked by the Malays, but had beaten them off. Having told the story of that engagement, Mr. Thompson went on. The breeze for the next ten days was steady and favorable. We were fairly on our way now, and began to hope that our ill luck was at an end, and that we were going to make a fast and comfortable homeward run. Ten days after we had left the island, the lookout reported a sail. We were taking a slight breeze along with us, and we came up fast to the ship, which was lying becalmed. "'What can she be doing, Mr. Wilson?' the captain said. "'She has got nothing above her topsails, although she must see that we are bringing down a breeze with us.' "'Can't make her out, sir,' Mr. Wilson replied. He fetched a glass from the companion and raised it to his eye. "'Her ensign's reversed, sir,' he exclaimed. "'She is in distress somehow.' We bore down to her, and the skipper threw the bark up into the wind within a hundred yards of her. Till we got close, we could not see a soul on deck, but now a head appeared above the bulwark. "'What's the matter with you?' the captain shouted. "'We have a fever on board. The captain and both mates are dead. There are only seven of us left alive, and two of them have got it. For God's sake, help us!' The men had shown themselves brave enough in their fight with the Malays, but standing as they were by the bulwark, watching the strange ship, there wasn't one but shrank back when he heard that hail. And well they might, for when the Indian fever gets on board a ship there is no saying what may come of it. There were white faces on the poop, too, and I reckon that there wasn't one of us who didn't feel a cold thrill run through him. "'What's to be done?' the captain said in a low voice, more as if he was asking the question of himself than us. At first no one spoke, and then Mr. Williams said, "'Our duty is clear.' God has sent us here to their aid, and whatever be the risk, we must run it. We cannot sail away and leave them to perish. It is a terrible choice to have to make, the captain said huskily. I am responsible for the lives of all on board this ship, passengers and crew. I know what these fevers are. They go right through a ship. There are but seven men alive now on yonder vessel. Another day or two there may not be one. If we have dealings with them, their fate may be ours. We are all in God's hands, the clergyman said quietly. I have over and over again risked the lives of my dear ones in his service, and I am ready to do so again. You agree with me, he said, turning to his wife and daughter, that, however great the danger, it is our duty to aid these poor creatures? Mrs. Williams glanced piteously at her daughter, and her lip quivered, but she bowed her head in assent, while Jane exclaimed, Of course, father, who could hesitate for a moment? THE MATE STORY, TWO The skipper looked at the rest of us. Not one of us but would rather have met a score of Preus, crowded with Malays thirsting for our blood, than have boarded that ship. But after Jane Williams had spoken, not one but was ashamed to say what he thought. At last, seeing none of the others would speak, I answered. If the ladies are ready to take the risk, sir, it is not for us men to draw back. As Mr. Williams says, we are all in God's hands, so let us do our duty. So be it, the captain said solemnly, and turning to the men who were clustered in the waist, he ordered a boat to be lowered. There was a general shout of, No, no, it will be throwing away our lives. Then an old sailor came forward. My mates have asked me, captain, to speak for them and say that they are of one mind that it will be just throwing away our lives to board that ship. We are ready to obey you, Captain Peters, to do our duty like men in storm or calm, but we won't have the plague brought on board this ship. There was a general chorus of assent, 
and some of the men sprang to the braces and prepared to haul the yards aft and put her on course again. We looked at the captain for orders. There were but three of us, for the trader and the parson couldn't be reckoned upon in a fight against the crew, and the passenger mate was still laid up with his leg. Men, the skipper said, remember that there are seven sailors like yourselves on board that ship who must die if you don't go to their rescue. Think what your feelings would be if you were in their case, and a ship came up within hailing distance and sailed away and left you to die. It comes to this, sir, the spokesman said. Like enough, they will die anyhow, whether they stop or whether they come on board. It ain't a case of saving their lives, for maybe they wouldn't be saved after all. We should just be throwing away our lives for nothing. Maybe the skipper was somewhat of the same opinion. Anyhow, there was no good trying to use force for they were eight to one against us. He half turned round, and wouldn't, I think, have said any more when Jane Williams stepped forward to the poop rail. Men, she said, my father has told me so much of English sailors, how brave they are, how ready to risk their lives for others, that I cannot think you really mean to sail away and desert these poor people. We are ready, my father, mother, and I, to run the risk. Surely you will do the same. The men stood silent a minute, and then, one after another, turned away, as if they could not stand her pleading face. But I could see that they were still determined not to risk having the plague on board. The sailor said a word or two to his mates, and then turned to her. The Mate's Story 3 There is not a man of this crew, miss, he said, but would do anything for you. Not one but would risk his life for you in a right-down manful fight but we are not ready to die like dogs, and that when maybe no good whatever would come of it. And we don't hold that just on the chance of saving seven lives. We are called upon to risk losing thirty. Jane turned round with a different expression on her face. I never saw anyone look like it, and never shall again. But it seemed to me that her face all shone, and she said, Then, father, we at least can do our duty, and our place is there. Her father understood her. You are right, Jane. Quite right, my child. Captain, will you give us one of the boats? I and my wife and daughter will go on board that ship. Will you leave our things at the Cape when you touch there for us to pick up, if it is God's will we ever reach the land? The captain stood like one dumb. Then I said, Captain Peters, as it seems there are no officers on board the ship, I will, if you give me permission, go on board her also and take charge. Very well, Mr. Thompson. If such is your wish, I shall certainly not oppose it, and I honor you for the proposal. Can you spare me four men, sir, if I can get them to volunteer? The captain nodded, and I turned to the men. My lads, I said, Mr. Williams, his wife and daughter are going on board that ship. They are going to leave the two brothers for good and to throw in their lot with those poor wretches there. With the captain's permission, I am going to take command of her, and I want four volunteers to go with me. I want no men with wives and children dependent on them, for we shall be taking our lives in our hands. I want four men who have no one to grieve for them at home if they die in doing their duty. I want four true English hearts who will imitate the example set them by these ladies. Eight of the men stepped forward at once. Sailors are curious creatures. There wasn't one of them but had shrunk from the idea of the introduction of fever on board the two brothers. But to go on board the pest-stricken vessel was an act of heroism, which they were ready to perform. Besides, though, they had refused to respond to the appeal of Jane Williams, and had held together as a body. There was not one of them who did not at heart feel ashamed at being beaten in courage by a girl. The eight men who stepped forward were, I believe, the only unmarried men among the crew, and I believe that had I asked them, there wasn't a man but would have gone. I chose four of them, and in a few minutes they had got their kits out of the facassel and placed them in one of the boats. The steward brought the boxes from the passenger's cabin, and the captain ordered a barrel of vinegar and a keg of powder to be hoisted into the boat. Just as the men were getting ready to lower her from the davits, the sailor who had acted as a spokesman came forward. Captain Peters, the men wants me to say as they have changed their minds and are ready to go off and bring those men on board. It isn't in the nature of men to stand by and see themselves beaten by two women. 
We had a short consultation, but Mr. Williams pointed out that the plan arranged was the best, as only those who went on board the ship were running a risk, while if the men were brought on board the two brothers, the whole crew might be carried off. Thank you, men, for your offer, he said to them, when we had talked it over. But the other plan is clearly the best, and I ask each and all of you to offer up a prayer to the Almighty God that he will protect us in this work which we undertake for his sake. The clergyman uncovered, as did every man on board, and you could have heard a pin drop as he prayed. Then those who were to go took their places in the boat, and as the skipper handed in the ladies, every man stood bareheaded. Not a word was said. I don't think anyone could have trusted himself to speak. I gave the word, the boat was lowered, and the falls unhooked. God bless you all, the captain said in a broken voice. There was a sort of murmur from the rest, and I don't believe there was a dry eye on the ship as we rowed away. The Mate Story 4 Now lads, I said as we got near the vessel, you must remember that the best preservative against the fever is to keep up your spirits. You must make up your minds that you have come on board to fight it, and you don't mean to be beaten, and with God's help and protection, I think that we shall win the day. You were all cheery and confident when those melees were coming on to attack us. We must fight the fever in just the same spirit. A rope was thrown as we came alongside, and I mounted onto the deck. Just as I did so, there came a cheer from the two brothers. It was a strange sort of cheer, but we understood that while our messmates wanted to say goodbye to us, their voices were too much choked to come out clear and strong. Give them a cheer back, lads, I said, and though there were only six men, the shout we gave was a deal louder and heartier than that of the whole crew of the two brothers. The ladies waved their handkerchiefs. Then we heard the skipper's voice across the water giving orders. The yard swung round, and the two brothers began to slip through the water again on her course. Then I jumped down from the rail onto the deck of the vessel. Four men were standing there. They looked ghastly and shrunken, as if they had scarce strength enough to haul a rope. Now, my lads, I said, I have been sent on board to take the command here. I have four hands with me, and the two ladies and a clergyman have been brave enough to come to nurse and help you. Where are the others? The two who are down with fever are in their bunks. The other man is seeing after them. Are there any dead on board? Yes. The captain and first mate are lying dead aft. One died yesterday, the other two days ago. There are two or three forward. It seemed no use to bury them. The tone in which the man spoke showed how thoroughly he had lost heart. Well, my lads, I said, now you have got to bestir yourselves. I shall not let my men come on board till the ship's cleared of dead. After that, they will come and make things tidy and shipshape. Just fetch up an old sail and some needles. Get some shot out of the rack. First of all, I will give you each some quinine. Two bottles were handed me up from the boat, and then I cast off the rope. Drop behind a hundred yards or so, I said to the men, and don't come up until I hail you. The thought that help was at hand cheered up the five sailors, and they set about the work with a will. One of them happened to be the sailmaker, and when the others brought up the bodies from the cabin, he sewed them up roughly in canvas with a couple of shot at their feet. As fast as they were done up, we hove them overboard. In an hour it was finished. Then I hailed the boat, and when it came up, told the men to come on deck. Mr. Williams, I said, I shall let you tow behind for a bit until I have got things pretty straight. Then we set to work in earnest. I flashed off a lot of gunpowder in the cabins and forecastle and then sluiced everything with vinegar and water. We washed down the floors and decks and everything we could get at. Then, when we had done everything we could to get the ship sweet, we hauled the boat alongside, got our passengers up, hoisted up the boat, squared our sails, and laid her head on her course. The Mate Story 5 We rigged up a sort of awning and brought the two sick men out of the forecastle and slung cots for them under it and the two ladies at once took charge of them. Then we set to work to get up a little tent for the ladies on the poop. We rigged an awning over the forecastle for the rest of us, for I thought it better that no one should sleep below. That night, one of the sick men died, but the next day the other showed signs of mending. This was hopeful, for not one of those who had caught the fever before had recovered. The next day, two men of the original crew were down with it. I can't tell you how the two ladies nursed those sick men. 
If they had been their own brothers, they could not have done more for them. The parson helped them. At first our hands were pretty full, as you may guess, and it was a good thing it was so, for the men had no time to think or to wonder whose turn was to come next. All hands were on duty during the day, and at night I divided them into two watches, four men in one and three in the other. I kept on deck all night and managed to get sleep in the daytime. Night and morning all hands mustered for prayers, and often, as we went about our work during the day, we could hear Jane Williams singing a hymn as she sat beside the sick men. The calmness of the two ladies did more even than work to keep up the men's heart and courage, and even the three of the old crew still on their feet picked up and grew hopeful. Neither of the two men last attacked died, and when four days more passed without anyone else sickening, we began to think that the fever had lost its power. But one morning, just as the dawn was stealing over the sky, Mrs. Williams came out from the little tent on the poop and hurried up to me as I was pacing up and down by the rail. There was no need for her to speak. It was light enough to see that her face was pale and her lips quivering, and her hands in sort of a restless flutter. I knew at once that Jane Williams was down with the fever. It seemed to me as if her voice sounded from a long way off as she said, "'Will you call my husband, Mr. Thompson? I fear that our Jane is ill.' It was light enough, but I stumbled against things half a dozen times as I made my way forward and sent the parson to his child. All that day the ship seemed under a spell. The men moved about without speaking a word and I am sure there was one of them who wouldn't have given his life for hers. It was late in the evening when Mr. Williams came forward and, taking my hand, said, Jane wishes to speak to you. Her mother came out of the tent as I went in. I moved up to the side of the cot on which Jane was lying and took her hand, but I couldn't have spoken if my life depended on it. She smiled quietly up at me. I wanted to say goodbye, Dick. I know what you have wished for, but you see... God has settled it otherwise, and he knows what is best for us. Do not grieve, dear. We shall meet again, you know. She died that night. Before morning a strong breeze sprang up and freshened to a gale. I didn't think we should live through it, short-handed as we were, and cared nothing whether we did or not. But I had to do my duty. We had to cut away many of the sails, for we were too weak to handle them. At last we got her under snug canvas. We ran four days before the gale, and when it died out got sail on again, and made our way safely to the cape. The gale had blown the last of the fever away, and by the time we reached the cape the three sick men were all fit for duty again. When we got there we fumigated and whitewashed her, and shipped some fresh hands and brought her home. Uncle Dick stopped. The story was told. To him it was ended when Jane Williams died. The three girls were crying quietly and not a word was spoken till the eldest rose from her seat, and putting her hands on his shoulders, stooped and kissed him. "'And that is the reason, Uncle Dick?' she said. "'Why, you never married?' "'I suppose so, Bessie. I have waited.' "'You know,' she said, "'we should meet again.'" End of Section 1 Recording by John Paul Nelson Section 2 of Tales from the Works of G. A. Henty. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gillian Hendry. Tales from the Works of G. A. Henty by G. A. Henty. The Explosion in the Vaughan Pit from Facing Death. Note Jack Simpson was a young collier working at the Vaughan Pit in Lancashire. By careful attention to his work, and by private study of the science of mining, he had raised himself to the position of viewer, or underground foreman. The mine having been found to be badly ventilated and dangerous, steps were being taken to put it right. But as the events of the following story show, it was too late. End note. One day, when Jack came up from his rounds at ten o'clock to eat his breakfast, and write up his journal of the state of the mine, he saw Mr. Brooke, the owner of the mine, and the manager drive up to the pit mouth. Jack shrank back from the little window of the office where he was writing, and did not look out again until he knew that they had descended the mine. He did not wish to have any appearance of thrusting himself forward. For another hour he wrote, and then the window of the office flew in pieces, the chairs danced, 
and the walls rocked, while a dull heavy roar, like distant thunder, burst upon his ears. Jack leaped to his feet and rushed to the door. Black smoke was pouring up from the pit's mouth. Sticks and pieces of wood and coal were falling in a shower in the yard, and Jack saw that his worst fears had been realised, and that a terrible explosion had taken place in the Vaughan pit. For a moment he stood stunned. There were, he knew, over three hundred men and boys in the pit, and he turned faint and sick as the thought of their fate came across him. Then he ran towards the top of the shaft. The bankman lay insensible at a distance of some yards from the pit, where he had been thrown by the force of the explosion. Two or three men came running up with white, scared faces. The smoke had nearly ceased already, the damage was done, and a deadly stillness seemed to reign. Jack ran into the engine house. The engine man was leaning against a wall, scared and almost fainting. Are you hurt, John? No. Pull yourself round, man. The first thing is to see if the lift is all right. I see one of the cages is at bank, and the force of the explosion is in the upcast shaft. Just give a turn or two to the engine and see if the winding gear is all right, slowly. The engine man turned on the steam. There was a slight movement, and then the engine stopped. A little more steam, Jack said. The cage has caught, but it may come. There was a jerk, and then the engine began to work. That is all right, Jack said, whether the lower cage is on or not. Stop now and wind it back, and get the other cage up again. Does the bell act, I wonder? Jack pulled the wire, which, when in order, struck a bell at the bottom of the shaft, and then looked at a bell hanging over his head for the answer. None came. I expect the wire's broken, he said and went out to the pit's mouth again. The surface men were all gathered round now, the tip men and the yard men, and those from the coke ovens, all looking wild and pale. I'm going down, Jack said. We may find some poor fellows near the bottom, and can't wait till a headman comes on the ground. Who will go with me? I don't want any married men, for you know, lads, there may be another blow at any moment. I will go with you, one of the yard men said, stepping forward. There's no one dependent on me. I too, said another. It doesn't matter to anyone but myself whether I come up again or not. The Vaughan Pit Part 2 Jack brought three safety lamps from the lamp room and took his place in the cage with the two volunteers. Lower away, he shouted, but go very slowly when we get near the bottom and look out for our signal. It was but three minutes from the moment that the cage began to sink to that when it touched the bottom of the shaft, but it seemed an age to those in it. They knew that at any moment a second explosion might come, and that they might be driven far up into the air above the top of the shaft, mere scorched fragments of flesh. Not a word was spoken during the descent, and there was a general exclamation of, Thank God, when they felt the cage touch the bottom. Jack, as an official of the mine, at once took the lead. Now, he said, let us push straight up the main road. Just as they stepped out, they came across the bodies of two men, and stooped over them with their lamps. Both dead, Jack said. We can do nothing for them. A little way on were some wagons thrown together in a heap and broken up, the body of a pony and that of the lad, his driver. Then they came to the first door, a door no longer, not a fragment of it remaining. In the door boy's niche, the lad lay in a heap. They bent over him. He is alive, Jack said. Will you two carry him to the cage? I will look around and see if there is anyone else about here. Beyond this way, there is no hope. Make haste. Look how the gas is catching inside the lamps. The place is full of fire damp. The men took up the lad and turned to go to the bottom of the shaft. Jack went a few yards down a crossroad and then followed them. He was in the act of turning into the next road to glance at that also when he felt a rush of air. Down on your faces, he shouted and, springing a couple of paces farther up the crossroad, threw himself on his face. There was a mighty roar, a thundering sound, as of an express train, a blinding light, and a scorching heat. Jack felt himself lifted from the ground by the force of the blast, and dashed down again. Then he knew it was over, and staggered to his feet. The force of the explosion had passed along the main road, and so up the shaft, and he owed his life to the fact that he had been in the side road, and off its course. He returned into the main road, but near the bottom of the shaft he was brought to a standstill. The roof had fallen, and the passage was blocked with fragments of rock and broken wagons. 
he knew that the bottom of the shaft must be partly filled up, that his comrades were killed, and that there was no hope of escape in that direction. For a moment he paused to consider, then, turning up the side road to the left, he ran at full speed from the shaft. He knew that the danger now was not so much from the fire damp, the explosive gas, as from the even more dreaded choke damp, which surely follows after an explosion. Many more miners are killed by this choke damp, as they hasten to the bottom of the shaft after an explosion, than by the fire itself. Choke damp, which is carbonic acid gas, is heavier than ordinary air, and thus the lowest parts of a colliery become first filled with it, as they would with water. In all coal mines there is a slight, sometimes a considerable, inclination, or dip, as it is called, of the otherwise flat bed of coal. The shaft is almost always sunk at the lower end of the mine, as by this means the whole pit naturally drains to the well at the bottom of the shaft. From there it is pumped up by the engine above. The loaded wagons, too, are run down from the workings to the bottom of the shaft with comparative ease. The Vaughan Pit, Part 3. The explosion had, as Jack well knew, destroyed all the doors which direct the currents of air, and the ventilation had entirely ceased. The lower part of the mine, where the explosion had been strongest, would soon be filled with choke damp, and Jack was making for the old workings, near the upper boundary line of the pit. There the air would remain pure long after it had become poisonous elsewhere. It was in this quarter of the mine that Bill Hayden, Jack's adopted father, and some twenty other colliers worked. Presently Jack saw lights ahead, and heard a clattering of steps. It was clear that, as he had hoped, the miners working there had escaped the force of the explosion, which had, without doubt, played awful havoc in the parts of the mine where the greater part of the men were at work. "'Stop! Stop!' Jack shouted as they came up to him. "'Is it fire, Jack?' Bill Hayden, who was one of the first, asked. "'Yes, Bill. Didn't you feel it?' Some of us thought we felt a suck of air a quarter hour since, but we weren't sure, and then came another, which blew out the lights. Come along, lad, there's no time for talking. It's of no use going on, Jack said. The shaft's choked up. I came down after the first blow, and I fear there's no living soul in the new workings. By this time they must be full of the choke damp. The men looked at each other with blank faces. Have you seen Brooke? Jack asked eagerly. Yes, he passed our stall with Johnson ten minutes ago, just before the blast came. We may catch him in time to stop him yet, Jack said, if he has gone round to look at the walling of the old workings. There are three men at work there. I'll go with you, Jack, Bill Hayden said. Our best place is my stall, lads, he went on, turning to the others. That is pretty well the highest ground in the pit, and the air will keep good there as long as anywhere, maybe till help comes. You come along with us, mate he said, turning to the man who worked with him in his stall. As he hurried along, Jack, in a few words, told what had taken place, as far as he knew it. Five minutes' run brought them to the place where the masons were at work, walling up the entrance to some old workings. They looked astonished at the newcomers. "'Have you seen Mr. Brooke?' "'Yes. He and the manager have just gone on. There, don't you see their lights down the heading? No? Well, I saw them a moment since.' "'Come along,' Jack said. "'Quick!' I expect they've met it. At full speed they hurried along. Presently they all stopped short. The lights burnt low and a choking sensation came on them. Back, Jack, for your life, gasped Bill Hayden. But at that moment Jack's feet struck something, which he knew was a body. Down at my feet, help, he cried. He stooped and tried to raise the body. Then the last gleam of his light went out. His lungs seemed to cease acting and he saw no more. The Vaughan Pit, Part 4 When he came to himself again, he was being carried on Bill Hayden's shoulder. All right, Dad, he said. I'm coming round now. Put me down. That's a good job, Jack. I thought you would scarce come round again. Have you got either of the others? We've got Brooke. You had your arm round him so tight that Ned and I lifted you together. He's on ahead. The masons are carrying him, and Ned is showing the way. Can you walk now? Yes, I'm better now. How did you manage to breathe, Dad? We didn't breathe, Jack. We're too old hands for that. When we saw you fall, we just drew back, took a breath, and then shut our mouths, and went down for you just the same as if we'd been a-groping for you under water. We got hold of you both, lifted you up, and carried you along as far as we could before we drew a breath again. You're sharp, Jack, but you don't know everything yet. 
and Bill Hayden chuckled to find that for once his practical experience taught him something that Jack had not learned from his books. Jack now hurried along after Bill Hayden, and in a few minutes reached the place fixed upon. Here the miners were engaged in restoring Mr. Brook, who was just beginning to show signs of life. It was not until Mr. Brook was able to sit up that they began to talk about the future. Jack's account of the state of things near the shaft was listened to gravely. The fact that the whole of the ventilation had been put out of order, and the proof given by the second explosion that the mine was somewhere on fire, were understood. It sounded their death now. Gallant and unceasing would be the efforts made under any other circumstance to rescue them, but the fact that the pit was on fire, and that fresh explosions might at any moment take place, would make it an act of simple madness for their friends above to try to clear the shaft and headings and to restore the ventilation. The fact was further made clear by a sudden flicker of the lamps and a faint shake, followed by a distant rumble. "'Another blast!' Bill Hayden said. "'That settles us, lads. We may as well turn out all the lamps but two, so as to have light as long as we last out.' "'Is there no hope?' Mr. Brook asked presently, coming forward after he had heard from Hayden's mate the manner in which he had been so far saved. "'None, master,' said Bill Hayden. "'We are like rats in a trap.' and it would have been kinder of us if we had let you lie as you were. Your intention was equally kind, Mr. Brook said, but is there nothing that we can do? Nothing, Bill Hayden said. We've got our dinners with us, and might make them last a mouthful at a time, to keep life in us for a week or more. But what would be the use of it? It may be weeks, aye, or months, before they can stifle the fire and make their way here. Can you suggest nothing, Jack? Mr. Brook asked. You are the only officer of the pit left now, he added with a faint smile. Jack had not spoken since he reached the stall, but had sat down on a block of coal, with his elbows on his knees and his chin on his hands, a favourite attitude of his when thinking deeply. The Von Pitt, Part 5 The other colliers had thrown themselves down on the ground. Some sobbed as they thought of their loved ones above, some lay in silence. Jack answered by rising to his feet. Yes, sir, I think we may do something. The men raised themselves in surprise. In the first place, sir, I should send men in each direction to see how near the choke damp has got. There are four roads by which it could come up. I would shut the doors on this side of the places it has got to, roll blocks of coal and rubbish to keep them tight, and stop up the chinks with wet mud. That will keep the gas from coming up, and there is air enough in the stalls and headings to last us a long time. But that would only prolong our lives for a few days, Jack, and I don't know that would be any advantage. Better to be choked by the gas than to die of starvation, Mr. Brook said, and a murmur from the men showed that they agreed with him. I vote for lighting our pipes, one of the miners said. If there is any fiery gas here, it would be better to finish with it at once. There was a general expression of approval. Wait, Jack said. Wait till I have done. You know, Mr. Brook, we are close to our north boundary here, in some places within a very few yards. Now, the Logan, which lies next to us, has been worked out years ago. Of course, it is full of water, and it was from fear of tapping that water that the works were stopped here. A good deal comes in through the coal in number 15 stall, which I expect is nearest to it. Now, if we could work into the Logan, the water would rush down into our workings, and as our pit is a good deal bigger than the Logan ever was, it will fill the lower workings and put out the fire, but won't reach us here. Then we can get up through the Logan, where the air is sure to be all right, as the water will bring good air down with it. We may not do it in time, but it is a chance. What do you say, sir? It is worth trying at any rate, Mr. Brook said. Bravo, my lad. Your clear head may save us yet. Now, lads, Mr. Brook continued, Jack Simpson is master now, and we will all work under his orders. But before we begin, boys, let us say a prayer. We are in God's hands. Let us ask his protection. Every head was bared, and the men stood reverently, while, in a few words, Mr. Brook prayed for strength and protection, and rescue from their danger. Now, Jack, he said when he had finished, give your orders. Jack at once sent off two men along each of the roads to find how near the choke damp had approached and to block up and seal the doors. It was necessary to strike a light to relight some of the lamps, but this was a danger that could not be helped. 
The rest of the men were sent round to all the places where work had been going on, to bring in the tools and dinners to number 15 stall, to which Jack himself, Bill Hayden, and Mr. Brooke proceeded at once. No work had been done there for years. The floor was covered with a black mud, and a close examination of the face showed tiny streamlets of water trickling down in several places. It was therefore determined to begin work in number 15. "'You don't mean to use powder, Jack?' Bill Hayden asked. "'No, Dad. Without any ventilation we should be choked with the smoke, and there would be the danger from the gas. When we think we're getting near the water, we will put in a big shot so as to blow in the face.' The Vaughan Pit Part 6 When the men returned with the tools and the dinners, the latter done up in handkerchiefs, Jack asked Mr. Brooke to take charge of the food. "'There are just twenty of us, sir, without you, and nineteen dinners.' So if you divide among us four dinners a day, it will last for five days, and by that time I hope we shall be free. Four men only could work at the face of the stall together, and Jack divided the twenty into five sets. We will work in quarter of an hour shifts at first, he said. That will give an hour's rest to a quarter of an hour's work, and a man can work well, we know, for a quarter of an hour. When we get done up, we will have half-hour shifts, which will give two hours for a sleep in between. The men of the first shift set to work without an instant's delay. The vigour and swiftness with which the blows fell upon the face of the rock told that the men who struck them were working for life or death. Jack took the others into the next stalls and set them to work to clear a narrow strip of the floor next to the upper wall. They were then to cut a little groove in the rocky floor to catch the water as it slowly trickled in and lead it to small hollows which they were to make in the solid rock. The water coming through the two stalls would, thus collected, be ample for their wants. Jack then started to see how the men at work at the doors were getting on. These had already nearly finished their tasks. On the road leading to the main workings, choke damp had been met with at a distance of fifty yards from the stall. But upon the upper road it was several hundred yards before it was found. On the other two roads it was over a hundred yards. The men had torn strips off their flannel jackets and had thrust them into the crevices of the doors and had then plastered mud from the roadway thickly on. There was now no reason to fear any new rush of choke damp unless indeed an explosion should take place so violent as to blow in the doors. This, however, was unlikely, as with a fire burning, the gas would ignite as it came out, and although there might be many smaller explosions, there would scarcely be one so serious as the first two which had taken place. The work at the doors and the water being over, the men all gathered in the stall. Then Jack insisted on an equal division of the tobacco, of which almost all the miners possessed some. Now that they were together again, all the lamps were put out, save the two required by the men at work. With work to be done and a hope of ultimate escape, the men's spirits rose, and between their spells they talked, and now and then even a laugh was heard. Mr. Brooke, although unable to do a share of the work, was very valuable in aiding to keep up their spirits, by his hopeful talk, and by stories of people who had been in great danger in many ways in different parts of the world, but who had at last escaped. Sometimes one or other of the men would propose a hymn, and then their deep voices would rise together, while the blows of the sledges and picks would keep time to the swing of the tune. On the advice of Mr. Brooke, the men divided their portions of food, small as they were, into two parts, one to be eaten every twelve hours, for as the work would proceed night and day, it was better to eat, however little, every twelve hours, than to go twenty-four without food. The Von Pitt Part 7 The first twenty-four hours over, the stall, or rather the heading, for it was now driven as narrow as it was possible for four men to work at once, had greatly advanced. Indeed, it would have been difficult even for a miner to believe that so much work had been done in the time. There was, however, no change in the appearances. The water still trickled in, but they could not see that it came faster than before. As fast as the coal fell, it was removed by one of the men who were next for work, so that there was not a minute lost from this cause. During the next twenty-four hours, almost as much work was done as during the first, but upon the third there was a decided falling off. The scanty food was telling upon them now. The shifts were lengthened to an hour, to allow longer time for sleep between each spell of work and each set of men, when relieved, threw themselves down exhausted, and slept for three hours, until it was their turn to wake up and remove the coal as the set at work got it down. 
At the end of seventy-two hours the water was coming through the face much faster than at first. The old miners, accustomed to judge by sound, were of opinion that the wall in front sounded less solid, and that they were coming to the old workings of the Logan Pit. In the three days and nights they had driven the heading nearly fifteen yards from the point where they had begun. Upon the fourth day they worked carefully, driving a borer three feet ahead of them into the coal, as in case of the water bursting through suddenly they would all be drowned. At the end of ninety hours from the time of striking the first blow, the drill which, Jack holding it, Bill Hayden was just driving in deeper with a sledge, suddenly went forward, and as suddenly flew out as if shot from a gun, followed by a jet of water driven with tremendous force. A plug, which had been prepared in readiness, was with difficulty driven into the hole. Two men, who had been knocked down by the force of the water, were picked up, much bruised and hurt, and with thankful hearts that the end of their labour was at hand, all prepared for the last part of their task. After an earnest thanksgiving by Mr. Brooke for their success thus far, the whole party partook of what was a heartier meal than usual, consisting of the whole of the remaining food. Then, choosing the largest of the drills, a hole was driven into the coal two feet in depth, and in this an unusually heavy charge was placed. "'We're done for after all!' Bill Hayden suddenly exclaimed. "'Look at the lamp!' Everyone present felt his heart sink at what he saw. A light flame seemed to fill the whole interior of the lamp. To strike a match to light the fuse would be to cause an instant explosion of the gas. The place where they were working being the highest part of the mine, the fiery gas which made its way out of the coal at all points above the closed doors had, being lighter than air, mounted there. "'Put the lamps out,' Jack said quickly. "'The gauze is nearly red-hot.' In a moment they were in darkness. The Von Pitt, Part 8 "'What is to be done now?' Mr. Brooke asked after a pause. There was silence for a while. The case seemed desperate. "'Mr. Brooke,' Jack said after a time, "'it is agreed, is it not, that all here will obey my orders?' "'Yes, certainly, Jack,' Mr. Brooke answered. "'Whatever they are?' "'Yes, whatever they are.' "'Very well,' Jack said. You will all take your coats off and soak them in water, then all set to work to beat the gas out of this heading as far as possible. When that is done as far as can be done, all go into the next stall and lie down at the upper end. You will be out of the way of the explosion there. Cover your heads with your wet coats, and Bill, wrap something wet round those cans of powder. What then, Jack? That's all, Jack said. I will fire the train. If the gas explodes at the match, it will light the fuse, so that the wall will blow in anyhow. No, no, a chorus of voices said. You will be killed. I'll light it, Jack, Bill Hayden said. I'm getting on now. It's no great odds about me. No, Dad, Jack said. I'm in charge, and it's for me to do it. You have all promised to obey orders, so set about it at once. Bill, take Mr. Brooke up first into the other stall. He won't be able to find his way about in the dark. Without a word, Bill did as he was told. Mr. Brooke giving one hearty squeeze to the lad's hand as he was led away. The others, accustomed to the darkness from boyhood, proceeded at once to carry out Jack's instructions, wetting their flannel jackets and then beating the roof with them towards the entrance to the stall. For five minutes they continued this, and then Jack said, Now, lads, off to the stall as quick as you can. Cover your heads well over. Lie down. I'll be with you in a minute, or, or as Jack knew well, he would be dashed to pieces by the explosion of the gas. He listened until the sound of the last footstep died away, waited a couple of minutes to allow them to get safely in position at the other end of the next stall, and then, holding the end of the fuse in one hand and the match in the other, he murmured a prayer and, stooping to the ground, struck the match. No explosion followed. He applied it to the fuse and ran for his life down the narrow heading, down the stall, along the horse road, and up the next stall. It's a light, he said as he rushed in. A cheer burst from the men. Cover your heads close, Jack said as he threw himself down. The explosion is sure to fire the gas. For a minute, a silence as of death reigned in the mine. Then there was a sharp, cracking explosion, followed by another like thunder. And while a flash of fire seemed to surround them, filling the air, firing their clothes and scorching their limbs, the whole mine shook with a deep roaring. The men knew that the danger was at an end, threw off the covering from their heads and struck out the fire from their garments. Some were badly burned about the legs, but any word or cry they may have uttered 
was drowned in the tremendous roar which continued. It was the water from the Logan pit rushing into the Vaughan. For five minutes the noise was like thunder. Then, as the pressure from behind decreased, the sound gradually grew less, and in another five minutes all was quiet. The Vaughan Pit, Part 9 then the men rose to their feet. The air in the next stall was clear and fresh, for as the Logan pit had emptied of water, fresh air had of course come down from the surface to take its place. We can light our lamps again safely now, Bill Hayden said. We shall want our tools, lads, and the powder. There may be some heavy falls in our way, and we may have hard work yet before we get to the shaft, but the roof rock is strong, so I believe we shall make our way. It lies to our right, Jack said, like our own. It is at the lower end of the pit, so, as long as we don't mount, we are going right for it. There were, as Hayden had expected, many heavy falls of the roof, but the water had swept passages in them, and it was found easier to get along than the colliers had expected. Still, it was hard work for men weakened by hunger, and it took them five hours of labour, clearing away masses of rock, and floundering through black mud, often three feet deep, before they made their way to the bottom of the Logan shaft. Then they saw the light far above them, the light that at one time they had never expected to see again. "'What o'clock is it now, sir?' Bill Hayden asked Mr. Brooke, who had from the beginning been the timekeeper of the party. Twelve o'clock exactly,' he said. "'It is four days and an hour since the pit caught fire.' "'What day is it, sir, for I've lost all count of time?' "'Sunday,' Mr. Brooke said, after a moment's thought. "'It could not be better,' Bill Hayden said. But there will be thousands of people from all round to visit the mine. How much powder have you, Bill? Jack asked. Four twenty-pound cans. Let us let off ten pounds at a time, Jack said. Just damp it enough to prevent it from flashing off too suddenly. Break up fine some of this damp wood and mix with it. It will add to the smoke. In a few minutes the powder was ready, and a light applied. It blazed furiously for half a minute, sending volumes of light smoke up the shaft. Flash off a couple of pounds of dry powder, Bill Hayden said. There's very little draught up the shaft, and it will drive the air up. For twenty minutes they continued flashing powder. Then they stopped and allowed the shaft to clear altogether of the smoke. Presently a small stone fell among them, another, and another, and they knew that someone had noticed the smoke. It was indeed true. Their smoke signal had been seen and understood, and before long they were all drawn safely to the surface. It may be imagined what excitement there was. Women crowded about Jack, calling down blessings on him for saving their husbands and sons and sweethearts from death. And Mr. Brooke was not slow to recognise his bravery and skill. He knew that if Jack's suggestions had been attended to, the explosion might not have happened. And so the young collier was made manager of the mine. End of section 2 Section 3 of Tales from the Works of G. A. Henty. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Tales from the Works of G. A. Henty by G. A. Henty. The Red Captain from one of the 28th. Ralph Conway, a young officer of the 28th Regiment, was stationed with a detachment on the south coast of Ireland. News was obtained that a notorious gang, led by a ruffian known as the Red Captain, was in hiding among some cliffs. The news came from a woman whose husband had, against his will, been forced to join the band. Captain O'Connor, Lieutenant Desmond, and Ralph started quietly before daylight, in hopes of surprising the gang before they could get news from their friends inland of the intended attack while it was arranged that a revenue officer with a boatload of men should cut off their escape by sea. The Red Captain, from one of the twenty-eighth. Daylight was faintly breaking when they reached the edge of the cliff. Ralph, with ten men, was posted at the spot where a slight track was visible, going down into a sort of gully. Captain O'Connor then proceeded with half the company to the right, Desmond taking the remainder to the left, each posting men at intervals along the edge of the cliff, and placing parties of four at every point where there appeared the smallest probability of an ascent being made. All were ordered to load at once. They were to seize anyone coming up the cliff, 
and in case of resistance to fire without hesitation the two officers then returned to the spot where they had left ralph it was now nearly broad daylight leaving the soldiers they went a short distance to a point where the rocks fell away precipitately and from here had a clear view of the face of the cliffs we had better wait here for a time the captain said the chances are that before long one of them will come out from their hiding place and perhaps make his way up to the top to look around if he does that will give us an indication as to the direction at any rate of their hiding place now i will take the ground in front do you watch to the left conway and you to the right desmond we had better lie down for on this jutting point we may catch the eye of any one down there before we can see him keep a sharp lookout lads it will save us a world of trouble if we can see one of them for half an hour they lay quiet then desmond suddenly exclaimed there's a man among those fallen rocks halfway up the side there he's gone perhaps we shall see him again in a moment for five minutes they lay with their eyes fixed on the rocks that desmond pointed out but there were no signs of life are you sure you were not mistaken desmond o'connor asked quite certain he suddenly appeared by the side of that gray boulder stood there for a moment then sunk down again i expect he must have got a view of one of the men somewhere along the top we will wait another ten minutes o'connor said and then we will take a party to the spot and search it thoroughly there is the coast guard boat so there is no fear of their getting away by water another quarter of an hour passed it's no use waiting any longer go along the line one each way and bring ten men from points where they can be spared we will leave them at the top of the path and take the party there down with us there are only four or five of them and ten men besides ourselves are ample for the business the red captain two the arrangements were soon made before starting on the descent o'connor said to the men we wish to take the fellows who are hiding down there alive if possible they are the gang of the fellow known as the red captain and have committed a score of murders but if it is absolutely necessary you will of course fire there is one man among them who is there on compulsion and less guilty than the rest he is a fair-haired man and i should think you would notice the difference between him and the others whatever resistance they make it is not probable that he will join in it at any rate do not fire at him unless it is absolutely necessary to save your own lives now see to your priming before we start and fix bayonets mind how you climb over these rocks because if any of you fall your musket may go off and shoot someone in front of you wherever it is possible scatter out abreast of each other so as to prevent the possibility of an accident now then march leading the way captain o'connor descended the little track it extended but a short distance beyond that a chaos of fallen rocks the remains of an old landslip stretched away to the shore there is no working along this sideways desmond captain o'connor said after they had climbed along for some little distance we had better make straight down to the shore follow that for a bit and then mount again to the spot where you saw the man it was difficult work but at last the party reached the shore lieutenant adcock who was in command of the boat had watched the party making their way down the rocks and now rowed in to within a few yards of them good morning lieutenant captain o'connor said i think we have got them fairly trapped but doubtless they would have made off if they hadn't seen you on watch outside it's that notorious scoundrel the red captain of galloway who is i hear hiding here with his gang indeed the revenue officer said that will be a capture worth making shall i come ashore with four of my men i expect they are more accustomed to climbing out among the rocks than yours are and i should like to lend a hand do by all means captain o'connor replied i see you have got ten and six will be quite enough in the boat even if they do manage to get down and embark which i don't think they will your men are all armed i suppose yes they all have carbines and cutlasses now coxswain i leave you in charge row out a quarter of a mile and if any boat pushes off you are to stop it and arrest all on board they will almost certainly resist and in that case you must use your arms now the four bow oars get out and step ashore red captain three when the lieutenant and his four men had landed the boat again pushed off and the party on shore made their way along the rock at the edge of the water until they were opposite the rock where lieutenant desmond had seen the man appear 
then the ascent was commenced the four officers went first the men following in a line bear a little to the left captain o'connor said it is likely to lie somewhere in that direction the man we saw would have been making toward the path and not from it keep a sharp lookout between these great rocks there's no saying where the entrance to their hiding place may be almost as he spoke there was a sharp crack of a rifle and the bullet struck the rock on which he was standing come on lads he shouted the sooner we are there the less time they have got to fire and with a cheer the men hurried forward scrambling recklessly over the rocks again and again puffs of smoke darted out from the rocks in front and one of the soldiers fell shot through the heart don't stop to fire captain o'connor shouted as a yell of rage broke from the men you will do no good and it will give them more time a dozen more shots were fired one of the coast guard men was shot through the shoulder but this was the only casualty for the quick movements of the men as they scrambled over the boulders disconcerted the aim of those above breathless and panting the four officers gained the spot from which the shots had been fired the men close up behind them but not a soul was to be seen wait a moment till you get your breath lads the leader said they can't be far from here we will find their hiding place presently never fear as they stood panting there was a shout from above the soldiers were standing along the edge of the cliff looking down upon the fight sergeant morris waved his arm they have made a way to your left sir he shouted at the top of his voice we have just caught sight of them among the rocks in two or three minutes captain o'connor led the way in that direction keep your eyes sharply about lads no doubt the place is cunningly hidden search among every clump of bushes between the rocks presently the sergeant shouted down from above i think you are far enough now sir we did not catch sight of them beyond that for an hour the search continued but without avail they must be here somewhere lads captain o'connor said we will find them if we have to stop here for a week and have provisions brought down from the village it's pretty evident there is no opening between the great rocks or we must have found it we must examine the smaller boulders they may have one so placed that it can be dropped over the entrance that flat slab is a likely looking place for instance three or four of you get a hold of it and heave it up the men gathered round to lift it ralph stooped down and peeped under as they did so hurrah he shouted there is an opening here several of the others now got hold of the stone it was upended and thrown backwards and the entrance to a passage some three feet high and two feet wide was revealed the red captain four i can smell a peat fire one of the men exclaimed this is the entrance no doubt captain o'connor said see the bottom is evidently worn by feet the passage must have been used for a long time but it's an awkward place to follow desperate men into it is indeed lieutenant adcock agreed they could shoot us down one by one as we go in they would see us against the light while we should be able to make out nothing surrender in there captain o'connor shouted you can't get away and i promise you all fair trial this summons was followed by a taunting laugh and a moment later there was a sharp sound within and a rifle bullet struck the side of the entrance and flew out it would be throwing away one's life to go in there captain o'connor said at any rate we have got them secure and they must come out in time but it would be madness to crawl in there on one's hands and feet to be picked off by those scoundrels at their ease now lads two of you stand by this entrance keep out of the line of fire and be ready with your bayonets to run any one through who comes out let the rest scatter and search round this place they may have another entrance if so we must find it in this first place it may be of an easier entry in the second they might escape from it after dark again the search began do you think it is likely to be higher up or lower down o'connor lieutenant desmond asked there's no saying desmond but as the passage seems to go straight in i should fancy above rather than below for a long time they searched without success then ralph who had gone higher up the rocks than the rest came upon a clump of low bushes growing between some large boulders there was nothing suspicious about them and he was turning away when he perceived a slight odour of peat smoke silently he made his way down to the captain i have found another entrance he said at any rate i think so for i certainly smelt smoke if we go quietly we may take them unawares captain o'connor passed the word along for the men to gather silently and ralph then led the way up to the clump of bushes 
Yes, I could smell the peat plainly enough. Now, Conway, do your search among the bushes. Carefully, lads, we don't know what the place is like. Cautiously, Ralph pushed the bushes aside. He saw at once that these had been carefully trained to cover a large hole. This was about three feet wide, and descended at a sharp angle, forming a sloping passage of sufficient height for a man to stand upright. Captain O'Connor knelt down and looked in. "'This looks more possible,' he said. "'But it's very steep. I should say it is not used by them, but acts as a sort of chimney to ventilate the cavern and let the smoke out. At any rate, we will try it, but we must take our boots off so as to get better hold on the rocks. Besides, we should make less noise.' Blunt and Jervis, do you go down to the other entrance again. It's likely enough that they may try to make a bolt that way if they hear us coming. Keep a sharp lookout down there, and be sure no one escapes. Don't you think, Captain O'Connor, that it would be a good thing to enter from there also, to the moment a row is heard going on within? Their attention will be taken up on your attack, and we may get in without being noticed. That's a very good idea, Conway, and you should carry it out. Take two more men with you, and make your way in as soon as you hear us engaged. But remember that it is quite possible we may not be able to get down. This passage may get almost perpendicular presently, and though I mean to go in if possible, even if I have a straight drop for it, it may get close up and be altogether impractical. So don't you try to enter till you are quite sure that they are engaged with us. Otherwise you will only be throwing away your life. I understand, sir. Ralph said as he turned to go off. If you get in, you can reckon on our assistance immediately. If not, we shall make no move. The Red Captain, 5. Ralph now took up his station at the mouth of the cavern with his six men, and lay down just in front of the opening, listening attentively. He could hear a continued murmur as of many voices. Get ready, lads, to follow me the instant you see me dive in, he said. I am sure by the sound there are more than four men in there, and Captain O'Connor may want help badly. Grasping a pistol in his left hand and his sword in his right, Ralph listened attentively. Suddenly he heard a shout, and then the discharge of a gun or pistol. In an instant he threw himself forward along the narrow passage. He had not gone more than three or four yards when he found that it heightened and he was able to stand upright. He rushed on, keeping his head low in case of the roof should lower again, and after a few paces entered a large cabin. It was dimly illuminated by two torches stuck against the wall. In a moment a number of figures rushed toward him with loud shouts, but before they reached him two of the soldiers stood by his side. Fire, he shouted as he discharged his pistol, and at the same moment the soldiers beside him fired their muskets. A moment later he was engaged in a fierce hand-to-hand -hand conflict. Several firearms had flashed off almost in his face. One of the soldiers fell with a sharp cry, but those who were following rushed forward. Ralph narrowly escaped having his brains dashed out by a clubbed rifle, but springing back just in time he ran his opponent through before he could recover his guard. Just at this moment a big man with a shock of red hair and a huge beard leveled a blunderbuss at him. It flashed across him that his last moment had come, when a man behind him leapt suddenly upon the ruffian's back, and they fell to the ground together. The blunderbuss going off in the fall and riddling a soldier standing next to Ralph with slugs. For two or three minutes a desperate struggle went on between Ralph and his six men, and those who attempted to break through them. Sturdily as the soldiers fought, they had been driven back toward the entrance by the assailants, armed with pikes and clubbed guns. There was no sound of conflict at the other end of the cave, and Ralph felt that the attack there had for some reason failed. "'Shoulder to shoulder, lads!' he shouted. "'We shall have help in a minute or two. He had emptied both his double-barreled pistols. His sword had just broken short in his hand while guarding his head from a heavy blow. He himself had been almost struck to the ground when there was a rush of men from behind him, and the rest of the soldiers poured in. "'Give them a volley, lads!' he shouted, "'and then charge them with the bayonets!' The muskets rang out, and there was a shout of, "'We surrender! We surrender!' A minute later the men were disarmed. The Red Captain, 6. There was still a desperate struggle going on on the ground. "'Here, lads,' Ralph said to two of his men, "'secure this red fellow. He's their leader. One of you bring a torch here.' The light was brought. 
it was seen that the man who had sprung upon the red captain's back had pinioned his arms to his sides and held him there in spite of the efforts of the ruffian to free himself two of the soldiers took off their belts and fastened them together passed them between the back of the man and his captor then strapped his arms firmly to his side the man who had held them released his grip stand over him with fixed bayonets and if he moves run him through now where is captain o'connor i don't know sir he and mr desmond and the lieutenant went down the hole in front of us we were following when the naval officer shouted up to us to run round to this entrance and make our way in there for he could go no further i'm here conway a faint voice said from the other end of the cabin but i've broken my leg i think and desmond has knocked all the wind out of my body ralph hastened to the spot from whence the voice came and found captain o'connor lying on the ground and lieutenant desmond insensible beside him what has happened ralph exclaimed have they shot you no hold the torch up and you will see the way we came the soldier did so and ralph looking up saw a hole in the top of the cave twenty feet above you don't mean to say you came through there o'connor i did worse luck to it o'connor said the passage got steeper and steeper and at last my foot slipped and i shot down and came plump into the middle of a peat fire and a moment later desmond shot down on top of me we scattered the fire all over the place as you can imagine but i burnt my hands and face and i believe the leg of my breeches is on fire something is hurting me furiously yes it's all smouldering ralph exclaimed putting it out with his hands have you got them all captain o'connor asked every one not one has made his escape it would have fared badly with us though if lieutenant adcock had not sent down his men to our assistance end of section three section four tales from the works of g a henty by g a henty this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Scott Kelly. A Wife's Stratagem from In Freedom's Cause. The story concerns the interesting period of Scottish history when Robert the Bruce was slowly wrestling Scotland from the power of England. The great Edward I, Longshanks, the Hammer of the Scots, had died, and his son, Edward II, had succeeded him, and was advancing to Scotland, with the immense army that was to meet destruction at Bannockburn. Archie Forbes, a Scottish gentleman who had fought under Wallace and Bruce, was made prisoner by the English and taken to Berwick Castle where he was confined in a cage, fixed outside the wall, and opening into a small cell, in which he passed the night. During the daytime he remained in the cage, in sight of the passers-by. The position of the cage was about twenty-five feet above the moat. The moat itself was some forty feet wide. A public path ran along the other side, and people passing here had a full view of the prisoner. There was still many of the Scottish birth in the town, in spite of the efforts which Edward had made to convert it into a complete English colony, and although the English were in the majority, Archie was subject to but little insult or annoyance. Although for the present in English possession, Berwick had always been a Scotch town, and might yet again, by the fortune of war, fall into Scottish hands. Therefore, even those most hostile to them felt it would be prudent to refrain from any demonstrations against the Scottish prisoners, since in the event of the city again changing hands, a fearful retaliation might be dealt to them. Occasionally, a passing boy would shout out a word of contempt or hatred, or throw a stone at the prisoner, but such trifles were unheeded by him. More often, Men or women passing would stop and gaze up at him with pitying looks, and would go away wiping their eyes. Archie, 
after the first careful examination of his cell, at once abandoned any hope of escape from it. The mass of bars would have defied the strength of twenty men, and he had no instrument of any sort with which he could cut them. There was, he felt, nothing before him but death, and although he feared this little for himself, he felt sad indeed as he thought of the grief of Marjorie and his mother. The days passed slowly. Five had gone without incident, and but two remained. He knew that there was no chance of any change in the sentence which Edward had passed, even were his son, Edward the Second, more disposed than Edward himself had been towards merciful measures to the Scots. That this would be the case, Archie had no warrant for supposing. The new king's time would be too closely engaged in the affairs of state, the arrangements of his father's funeral, and the details of the army advancing against Scotland, to give a thought to the prisoner whose fate had been determined by his father. Absorbed in his own thoughts, Archie seldom looked across the moat, and paid no heed to those who passed, or who paused to look at him. On the afternoon of the fifth day, however, his eyes was caught by two women who were gazing up at the cage. In a moment he started violently and almost gave a cry, for in one of them he recognized his wife, Marjorie. The instant that the woman saw that he had observed them, they turned away and walked carelessly and slowly along the road. A wife Stratagem Two. Archie could hardly believe that his eyesight had not deceived him. It seemed impossible that Marjorie, whom he had deemed a hundred miles away, in his castle at Aberfilly, should be here in the town of Berwick. And yet when he thought it over, he saw that it might well be so. There was indeed ample time for her to have made the journey two or three times. While he had been laying in prison at Port Patrick, awaiting a ship. She would be for sure, when the news reached her of his capture, that he would be taken to Edward at Carlisle, and that he would be either executed there or at Berwick. It was then by no means impossible, strange and wondrous as it appeared to him, that Marjorie should be in Berwick. She was attired in the garment of a peasant woman of the better class such as the wife of a small crofter or farmer. Remembering that she had saved his life before, at Dunstaffnage, Archie felt that she had come hither to try to rescue him. Archie's heart beat with delight, and his eyes filled with tears at the devotion and courage of Marjorie. For the first time since he had been hurried into the boat on the night of his capture, a feeling of hope entered his breast. Momentary as the glance had been which he had obtained of the face of Marjorie's companion, Archie felt perceived that it was in some way familiar to him. In vain he recalled the features of the various servants at Aberfilly, and those of the wives and daughters of the retainers of the estate. He could not recognize the face of the woman accompanying Marjorie as belonging to any of them. His wife might, indeed, have brought with her someone from the estates at Ayr, whom she had known from a child, but in that case Archie could not account for his knowledge of her. This, however, did not occupy his mind many minutes. It was assuredly one whom Marjorie trusted, and that was sufficient for him. Then his thoughts turned wholly to his wife. Anyone who had noticed the prisoner's manner for the last few days would have been struck with the change which had come over it. A third o he had stood, often for hours, leaning motionless with his arms crossed, in the corner of his cage, with head bent down and listless air, his thoughts only being busy. Now he paced restlessly up and down his narrow limits, two steps each way, and then a turn, like a caged beast. His hands were clenched, his breast heaved, 
his breath came fast, his head was thrown back, often he brushed his hands across his eyes, and rapid words came from his lips. The sun sank. An hour later, a jailer brought his jug of water and piece of bread, and then, without a word, retired, leaving, as usual, the door into the cell open, but carefully locking and barring the inner door. Archie had a longer walk now, from the front of the cage to the back of the cell, and for three hours he paced up and down. A Wife's Stratagem Three. Sometimes he paused and listened attentively. The sounds in the town gradually died away, and all became still, save that he could hear the calls of the water on the battlement above him. The night was a very dark one, and he could scarcely make out the gleam of water in the moat below. Suddenly something struck him with a sharp blow on his face and fell at his feet. He stooped and picked it up. It was an arrow with a wad of wool fastened round its point to prevent it from making a noise when it should strike the wall or the cage. To the other end was attached a piece of string. Archie drew it in until he felt that it was held firmly. Then after a moment the hold relaxed somewhat, and the string again yielded as he drew it in. Presently a stout rope, strong enough to bear his weight, came into his hands. At the point of junction was attached some object done up in flannel. This he opened, and found that it was a fine saw and a bottle of containing oil. He fastened the rope securely to one of the bars, and at once commenced to saw, asunder, one of the others. In five minutes two cuts had been noiselessly made, and a portion of the bar five feet long came away. He now tried the rope and found that it was tightly stretched and eventually fixed to some object on the other side of the moat. He grasped it firmly with his arms and legs and slid rapidly down it. In another minute he was grasped by some strong arms, which checked his rapid progress and enabled him to gain his feet without the slightest noise. As he did so, a woman threw her arms round him, and he exchanged a passionate but silent embrace with Marjorie. Then she took his hands, and with noiseless steps they proceeded down the road. He had, before starting, removed his shoes and put them in his pockets. Marjorie and her companion had also removed their shoes, and even the keenest ears upon the battlements would have heard no sound as they proceeded along the road. Fifty yards farther, and they were among the houses. Here they stopped a minute and put on their shoes, and then continued their way. Not a word was spoken until they had traversed several streets, and stopped at the door of a house in a quiet lane. It yielded to Marjorie's touch. She and Archie entered, and their follower closed, and fastened it after them. A wise stratagem. Four. The moment this was done, Marjorie threw her arms around Archie's neck with a burst of tears of joy and relief. While Archie was soothing her, the third person stirred up the embers on the hearth and threw on a handful of dry wood. And who is your companion? Archie asked, after the first transports of joy and thankfulness were past. What? Don't you recognize Clenny? Marjorie asked, laughing through her tears. Clenny, of course, Archie exclaimed, grasping his follower's hand in his. I only caught a glimpse of your face and knew that it was familiar to me, but in vain tried to recall its owner. Why, Clenny, it is a long time since you went dressed as a girl in ire, and so it is, my good friend, who has shared my wife's dangers. He has done more than that, Archie, Marjorie said, for it is him that I owe my first idea of coming here. The moment after the castle was taken, 
and it was found that you had been carried off in a boat and by the English. Clenny started to tell me the news, and your mother and I were beside ourselves with grief, and Clenny, to comfort us, said, Do not despair yet, my lady. My lord shall not be killed by the English, if I can prevent it. The master and I have been in a good many dangers and have always come out of them safe. It shall not be my fault if he does not slip through their hands yet. Why, what can you do, Clenny? I said. I don't know what I can do yet, he replied. That must depend upon circumstances. My lord is sure to be taken to Carlisle, and I shall go south to see if I cannot get him out of prison. I have often gone among the English garrisons disguised as a woman, and no one in Carlisle is likely to ask me my business there. It was plain to me at once that if Clenny could go to your aid, so could I, and I at once told him that I should accompany him. Clenny raised all sorts of objections, but to these I would not listen. I brought him to my will by saying, that if he thought my being with him would add to his difficulties, I would go alone. But that go I certainly would. So without more ado, we got those dresses and made south. We had a few narrow escapes of falling into the hands of parties of English, but at last we'd cross the frontier and reach Carlisle. Three days later we heard of your arrival and the next morning all men were talking about your defiance of the king, and that you had been to Berwick for execution at the end of the week. So we journeyed hither, and got here the day after you arrived. The first step was to find a Scotch woman who we might trust. This, by great luck, we did. Mary Mountain, who lives in this house, is a true Scotch woman, and will help us to the extent of her power. She is poor, for her husband, who is an Englishman, had for some time been ill, and died but yesterday. He was, by what she says, a hard man and cruel, and his death is no grief to her, and Mary will, if she can, return with her daughter to Roxburgh where her relations live, and where she married her husband, who was a soldier in the English garrison there. A wife stratagem. Five. But Marjorie, Archie said, have you thought how we are to escape hence? Though I am free from the castle, I am still within the walls of Berwick. And when, tomorrow, they find that I have escaped, they will search every nook and corner of that town. I had best without delay try and make my way over the walls. That was the plan Clenny and I first thought of, Marjorie replied. But owing to the raids of the Douglas on the border, so strict a watch is kept on the walls that it would be difficult indeed to pass. Clenny had tried a dozen times each night, but the watch is so vigilant that he had each time failed to make his way past them, but has been challenged, and has had several arrows discharged at him. The guard at the gates is extremely strict, and all cots that pass in and out are searched. Could you have tried to pass before your escape was known, you might no doubt have done so in disguise, but the alarm will be given before the gates are open in the morning and your chance of passing through undetected then would be small indeed. The death of the man Martin suggested a plan to me. I have proposed it to his wife, and she has fallen in with it. I have promised her a pension for life if we should succeed, but I believe she would have done it even without reward, for she is a true Scotch woman. When she heard who it was that I was trying to rescue, 
she said at once she would risk anything to save the life of one of Scotland's best and bravest champions. While, on the other hand, she cares not enough for her husband to offer any objection to my plan for the disposal of his body. But what are your plans, Marjorie? All the neighbors know that Martin is dead, and they believe that Clenny is Mary's sister and I her niece, and she has told them that she will return with us to Roxburgh. Martin was a native of a village four miles hence, and she was going to bury him with his fathers there. Now I have proposed to her that Martin shall be buried beneath the wood store here, and that you shall take his place in the coffin. It is a capital idea, Marjorie. Archie said. And will assuredly succeed if any plan can do so. The only fear is that the search will be so hot in the morning that the soldiers may even insist upon looking into the coffin. We have thought of that, Marjorie said, and dare not risk it. We must expect every house to be searched in the morning and have removed some tiles in the attic. At daybreak you must creep out of the roof, replace the tiles, and remain hidden there until the search is over. Martin will be laid in the coffin. Thus, even should they lift the lid, no harm will come of it. Directly they have gone, Clanny will bring you down, and you and he will dig the grave in the floor of the woodshed, and place Martin there. Then you will take his place in the coffin, which will be placed in a cart already hired, and Clunny, I, Mrs. Martin, and her daughter will then set out with it. A Wife Stratagem 6. Soon after daybreak, the quick strokes of the alarm bell at the castle told the inhabitants of Berwick that a prisoner had escaped. Archie at once betook himself to his place of concealment on the roof. He replaced the tiles, and Clunny carefully removed all signs of the place of escape from within. A great hubbub had by this time arisen in the streets. Trumpets were blowing, and parties of soldiers moving about in all directions. The gates remained unopened, orders being given that none should pass through without a special order from the governor. The sentries on the wall were doubled, and then a house-to-house -house search was commenced, every possible place of concealment being rummaged from basement to attic. Presently the searchers entered the lane in which Mrs. Martin lived. The latch was ere long lifted, and a sergeant and six soldiers burst into the room. The sight which they beheld quieted their first noisy exclamations. Four women in deep mourning were kneeling by a rough coffin placed on trestles. One of them gave a faint scream as they entered, and Mary Martin, returning to her feet, said, "'What means this rough intrusion?' "'It means,' the sergeant said, that a prisoner has escaped from the castle, Juan Archibald Forbes, a pestilent Scotch traitor. He had been aided by his friends from without, as the sentries were watchful all night. He must be hidden somewhere in the town, and every house is to be searched. You can search if you will, the woman said, resuming the position on her knees. As you see, this is a house of mourning. Seeing that my husband is dead, and is today to be buried in his native village four miles away. He won't be buried today, the sergeant said, for the gates are not to be opened save by special order of the governor. Now, lads, he went on, turning to his men, search the place from top to bottom. Examine all the cupboards and sound the floors. Turn over all the wood in the shed 
and leave not a single place unsearched where a mouse could be hid. The soldiers scattered through the house, and were soon heard knocking the scanty furniture about, and sounding the floors and walls. At last they returned, saying that nothing was to be found. And now, the sergeant said, I must have a look in that coffin. Who knows but when the traitor Scott may be hidden there. Mrs. Martin leaped to her feet. You shall not touch the coffin, she said. I will not have the remains of my husband disturbed. The sergeant pushed her roughly aside, and with the end of his pike prized up the lid of the coffin, while Mrs. Martin and the other three mourners screamed lustily and wrung their hands in the greatest grief. A Wife Stratagem 7 Just as the sergeant opened the coffin and satisfied himself that a dead man really lay within, an officer, attracted by the screams, entered the room. "'What is this, sergeant?' he asked angrily. "'The orders were to search the house, but none were given you to trouble the inmates.' Mrs. Martin began to complain of the conduct of the soldiers in wrenching open the coffin. "'It was a necessary duty, my good woman,' the officer said, "'seeing that a living man might have been carried away instead of a dead one. However, I see all is right.' "'Oh, kind sir,' Mrs. Martin said, sobbing, "'is it true what this man tells me? "'That there is no passage through the gate today. "'I have hired a car to take away my husband's body. "'The grave is dug, and the priest will be waiting. "'Kind sir, I pray of you to get me a pass to go out with it, "'together with my daughter, sister, and niece.' "'Very well,' the officer said kindly. "'I will do as you wish. "'I shall be seeing the governor presently "'to make my report to him, "'and as I have myself seen the dead body, "'can vouch that no ruse is intended. "'But assuredly no pass will be given "'for any man to accompany you, "'and the Scot, who is a head and shoulders "'taller than any of you, would scarcely slip out in a woman's garment. When will the cart be here? At noon, the woman replied. Very well. An hour before that time a soldier will bring you the pass. Now, Sergeant, have you searched the rest of the house? Yes, sir. Thoroughly. And nothing suspicious has been found. Draw your men, then, and proceed with your search elsewhere. No sooner had the officer and the men departed than Cliney ran upstairs, and removing two of the tiles, whispered to Archie that all was clear. The hole was soon enlarged. Archie re-entered, and the pair descended to the woodshed, which adjourned the kitchen. There, with a spade and a mattock, which Cluny had purchased on the preceding day, they set to work to dig a grave. In two hours it was completed. The body of John Martin was lowered into it, the earth replaced and trodden down hard, and the wood again piled to it. At seven o'clock a soldier entered with the governor's pass, ordering the soldier at the gate to allow a cart with the body of John Martin, accompanied by four women, to pass out from the town. At the appointed time the cart arrived. Archie now took his place in the coffin. Then some neighbors came in and assisted in placing the coffin in the cart. The driver took his place beside it, and the four women, with their hoods drawn over their heads, fell in behind it, weeping bitterly. When they arrived at the gate, the officer in charge carefully read the order, and then gave the order for the gate to be opened. 
But stop, he said. This pass says nothing about a driver. And though this man in no way resembles the description of the doughty Scot, yet he is not named in the pass, I cannot let him through. There was a moment's pause of consternation, and then Clunny said, Sister Mary, I will lead the horse. When all is in readiness, and the priest waits, we cannot turn back on such a slime cause. As the driver of the cart knew Mary Martin, he offered no objection, and descended from his seat. Clunny took the reins, and walking by the side of the horse's head, led it through the gates as they were opened, the others following behind. As soon as they were through, the gates closed behind them, and they were safely out of the town of Berwick. End of Tales from the Works of G. A. Henty by G. A. Henty Section 5 of Tales from the Works of G. A. Henty This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Tales from the Works of G. A. Henty by G. A. Henty Kindness Rewarded from Captain Bailey's Heir The daughter of Captain Bailey, a wealthy old Indian officer, made a marriage much beneath her, and was disowned by her father. Her husband dies, and when in the extremity of poverty, she meets with an accident in the streets of London. She is taken in and kindly cared for by John and Sarah Hole, the former being a dustman. The lady dies, and her infant is brought up by John Hole and his wife as their own. The child is one day run over by a passing cart and grows up a cripple. An accident leads to the discovery of his parentage. Captain Bailey at once recognizes him as his heir, and by the advice of the doctors he calls in, determines to take him to some foreign baths which might bring about a cure. Before starting abroad, Captain Bailey carried out his plan for rewarding John and Sarah Hull for the kindness they had shown to Harry. After consultation with his grandson, he had concluded that the best plan of doing so would be to help them in their own mode of life. He accordingly called upon the dust contractor for whom John Hall worked, a man who owned twenty carts. An agreement was soon come to with him, by which Captain Bailey agreed to purchase his business at his own price, with the whole of the plant, carts, and horses. A fortnight after this, John's master said to him one day, "'John, I have sold my business. You are going to have a new master.' "'I am sorry for that,' John said, "'for we have got on very well together for the last fifteen years.' "'Besides,' he added thoughtfully, "'it may be bad for me. "'I am not as young as I used to be, "'and he may bring new hands with him.' "'I will speak to him about you, John,' his master said. "'He is a good sort of man, "'and I dare say I can manage it. "'The thing is going to be done well. Three or four new carts are to be put on "'instead of some of the old ones, "'and there are ten first-rate horses "'coming in place of some of those "'that are getting past work. "'The stables are all being done up, and the thing is going to be done first-rate. Curiously enough, his name is the same as yours, John Hall. Is it now? John said. Well, it will be odd to see my own name on the carts. John Hall, dust contractor. It doesn't sound bad, either. So you will speak to him? Yes, I will speak to him, his employer answered. Three days later, John received a message from his master to the effect that the new owner would take possession next day and that he was to call at the office at eleven o'clock. He added that his new employer said that he wished Mrs. Hall to go round with her husband. John and Sarah were greatly puzzled with the latter part of this message, until they thought that probably their late employer had mentioned that Mrs. Hall went out charring and cleaning, and they might intend to engage her to keep the office tidy. Kindness Rewarded, too. Accordingly, at eleven o'clock on the following day, John and Sarah presented themselves at the office at Chelsea. As they entered the yard, they were greatly amused at seeing all the carts ranged along in the glory of new paint, with John Hull, dust contractor, in large letters on their sides. A boy was in the office, who told them that they were to go to the house. 
The yard was situated near the river, and the house which adjoined it was a large old-fashioned building, standing in a pretty walled garden. They went to the back door and knocked. It was opened by a bright-looking servant girl. "'Is Mr. Hall in?' Sarah asked. "'You are to be shown in,' the girl said, and ushered them into a large, old-fashioned parlor, comfortably furnished. John and Sarah gave a cry of surprise, for, sitting by the fire in his wheeled box, just as in olden time, was Harry. Scarce a day had passed since he had left them without his coming in for half an hour's chat with them, but his appearance here struck them with astonishment. "'What are you doing here, Harry?' Mrs. Hall asked. "'Do you know our new master?' "'Yes, mother, I know him. Captain Bailey has had some business with him, and asked me to come down here to see him. You are to sit down until he comes.' "'But that will never do, Harry. Why, what would he think of us if he comes in and finds us sitting down in his parlor just as if the place belonged to us?' "'It's all right, mother. I will make it right with him. He's a good fellow, is the new master, a first-rate fellow.' "'Is he now?' John asked, interested, as he and Sarah, seeing nothing else to do, sat down. "'And his name is John Hall, just the same as mine?' "'Just the same, John, and he's not unlike you, either. Now, when I tell you what a kind action he did once, you will see the sort of fellow he is. Once, a good many years ago, when he wasn't as well off as he is now, when he was just a hard-working man earning his weekly pay, a poor woman with a child fell down dying at his door. Well, you know, other people would have sent for a policeman and had them taken off to the workhouse, but he and his wife took them into their house and tended the lady till she died. That was a right-down good thing, John said quite unmindful of the fact that he, too, had done such an action. Kindness Rewarded 3. Sarah did not speak, but gave a little gasping cry and threw her apron, which she wore indoors and out, over her head, a sure sign with her that she was going to indulge in what she called a good cry. John looked at her in astonishment. And more than that, John, Harry went on, they kept the child and brought him up as one of their own, and though afterwards they had a large family, they never made him feel that he was a burden to them, though he grew up a cripple, and was able to do nothing to repay them for all their goodness. Well, at last the boy's friends were found. They had lots of money, and the time came at last when they bought a business for John Hall, and when he came, there the crippled boy was, sitting at the fire to welcome them, and say, Welcome, father, and welcome, mother, and Harry held out his hands to them both. Even now John Hall did not understand. He was naturally dull of comprehension, and the loud sobbing of his wife so bewildered and confounded him that it divided his attention with Harry's narrative. "'Yes, Harry,' he said, "'it's all very nice. But what's come to you, Sarah? What are you making all this fuss about? We shall be having the new master coming in and finding you sobbing and rocking yourself like a mad woman. Cheer up, old woman, what is it?' "'Don't you see, John?' Sarah sobbed out. Don't you see? Harry has been telling you your own story. Don't you see that it is you he has been talking about, and that you are John Hall, dust contractor? Me? John said in utter bewilderment. Yes, father, Harry said, taking his hand. You are the John Hall. This house, and the business, and the carts and horses are yours. Captain Bailey has bought them all for you. He would not come here himself, as I wished him, but he asked me to tell you and mother how glad he was to be able to repay, in a small way, he said, your great kindness to me, and how we hoped that you would prosper here and be as happy as you deserve to be. You will be better off than your last master, for he had to pay rent for this house and yard, but his grandfather has bought the freehold of them all for you, you will have no rent to pay. Therefore I hope, even in bad times, you will be able to get along comfortably. There, father. There, mother, dry your eyes and look sharp, for I can hear voices in the garden. Evan went to your house after you had gone to bring all the children round here in a cab. You will find everything in the house, mother, and you must get a grand tea as soon as possible. I have got a servant for you, for, you know, you must have a servant now. The next minute the children came bounding in, wild with delight, and a happier party never assembled than those who sat round the table of John Hall, dust contractor, on the evening of his first taking possession of his new property. End of section five. Recording by Todd. Section six of Tales from the Works of G. A. Henty. 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rachel. Tales from the Works of G. A. Henty by G. A. Henty. A Battle with Wolves from The Young Carthaginian. Malchus, a young officer of the guard of the great Carthaginian general Hannibal, goes out with two companions on a hunting expedition among the mountains of Spain. After a long day's sport they fail to find their camp and decide to sleep out in the woods. After eating their meal and chatting for some time, Halcon and his companion lay down to rest, Malchus volunteering to keep the first watch. For some time he sat quietly, occasionally throwing logs on the fire from the store which they had collected in readiness. Presently his attitude changed. He listened intently and rose to his feet. Several times he had heard the howls of wolves wandering in the woods, but he now made out a long, deep, continuous howling. He listened for a minute or two, and then aroused his companions. "'There's a large pack of wolves approaching,' he said and by the direction of the sound I judge they are hunting on the traces of our footsteps. That is the line by which we came down from yonder brow, and it seems to me that they are ascending the opposite slope. Yes, and by the sound there must be a very large pack of them, Halcon agreed. Pull up the fire and set yourselves to gather more wood as quickly as possible. These beasts in large packs are formidable foes. The three men set to work, vigorously cutting down brushwood and lopping off small boughs of trees with their swords. Divide the fire in four, Halkin said, and pile the fuel in the center. They will hardly dare to pass between the fires. The pack was now descending the slope, keeping up a chorus of howls and short yelps, which sent a shiver of uneasiness through Malchus. As the wolves approached the spot, the howling suddenly ceased. They see us, Halkin said. Keep a sharp lookout for him, but do not throw away a shot. We shall need all our arrows before daylight. Standing perfectly quiet, the friends could hear the pattering sound made by the wolves' feet upon the fallen leaves, but the moon had sunk now and they were unable to make out their figures. "'It seems to me,' Malchus said in a whisper, "'that I can see specks of fire gleaming on the bushes.' "'It is the reflection of the fire in their eyes,' Halkin replied. "'See, they're all around us. There must be scores of them.' For some time the wolves approached no closer, then— Encouraged by the silence of the little group standing in the centre of the fires, two or three grey forms showed themselves in the circle of light. Three bows twanged. Two of the wolves fell, and the third, with a howl of pain, fled in the darkness. There was a sound of snarling and growling, a cry of pain, a fierce struggle, and then a long continued snarling. "'What are they doing?' Malchus asked with a shudder. I believe they're eating their wounded comrade, Halkin replied. I have heard such is the custom of the savage brutes. See, the carcasses of the other two have disappeared already. A Battle with the Wolves, too. Short as had been the time which had elapsed since they had fallen, other wolves had stolen out, and had dragged away the bodies of the two which had been killed. The incident, which showed how extreme was the hunger of the wolves, and how noiseless were their motions, redoubled the vigilance of the party. Malchus threw a handful of brushwood on to each of the fires. "'We must be careful of the fuel,' Halkin said. "'I would we have thought of this before we lay down to sleep. If we'd collected wood enough for our fires we should have been safe, but I doubt much if our supply will last till morning.' As the hours went on the attitude of the wolves became more and more threatening, and in strong bodies they advanced close up to the fires. Every time that they did so, armfuls of fuel were thrown on the fires. As the flames leapt up brightly, they each time fell back, losing several of their numbers from the arrows of the little party. But the pile of fuel was now sinking fast, and except when the wolves advanced it was necessary to let the fires burn down. "'It must want four hours yet of daylight,' Halkin said as he threw on the last piece of wood. "'Look round as the fire blazes up, and see if you can make out any tree which may be climbed.' I would that we had taken to them at first instead of trusting to our fires. Unfortunately, they had chosen a somewhat open space of ground for their encampment, for the brushwood grew thick among the trees. "'There's a tree over there,' Malchus said, pointing to it, "'with a bough of but six feet from the ground. One spring on to that and we're safe.' "'Very well,' Halkin assented. "'We will attempt it at once before the fire burns low.' 
Put your swords into your sheaths, sling your bows and arrows behind you, and take each a burning brand. These will be better weapons in such a case than swords or spears. Now are you ready? Now! Waving the burning brands over their heads, the three Carthaginians dashed towards the tree. It seemed as if the wolves were conscious that their prey were attempting to escape them, for with a fierce howl they sprang from the bushes and rushed to meet them, and, heedless of the blazing brands, sprang upon them. Malchus scarce knew what passed in the short, fierce struggle. One wolf sprang upon his shield and nearly brought him to the ground, but the sharp boss pierced its body, and he flung it from him, at the same moment that he dashed the brand full in the face of another. A third sprang upon his shoulder, and he felt its hot breath in his face. Dropping his brand, he drove his dagger deep into its side. Then he hurled the heavy shield among the mass of wolves before him, took a bound into their midst, and, grasping the bow, swung himself into the tree, and sat there with his legs drawn up as a score of wolves leapt up towards him with open mouths. He gave a cry of horror. His two friends were down, and a confused mass of struggling bodies alone showed where they had fallen. For an instant he hesitated, debating whether he should leap down and strive to rescue them, but a glance below showed him that he would be pulled down long before he could reach the spot where they had fallen. Shifting himself along the arm until he reached the trunk, he rose to his feet and sent his arrows vengefully into the midst of the struggling mass of wolves until he had but three or four shafts left. These he reserved as a last resource. A Battle with the Wolves Three. There was nothing to do now, and he sat down on the branch and burst into tears over the fate of his comrades. When he looked up again, all was quiet. The fierce pack had devoured not only his comrades but their own fallen companions, and now sat in a circle with their red tongues hanging out and their eyes fixed upon him. As the fire gradually died out their forms disappeared, but he could hear their quick breathing and knew that they were still on the watch. Malchus climbed the tree until he reached a fork where he could sit at ease and there waited for morning, when he hoped that his foes would disappear. But as the grey light dawned he saw them still on the watch, nor as the dawn brightened into day did they show any signs of moving. When he saw that they had no intention of leaving the place, Malchus began to consider seriously what he had best do. He might still be, for aught he knew, miles away from the camp, and his friends there would have no means of knowing the position in which he was placed. They would no doubt send out all the soldiers in search of the party. But in that broken wilderness of forest and mountain it was the merest chance whether they could find the spot where he was prisoner. Still it appeared to him that this was the only possibility of his rescue. The trees grew thickly together, and he could easily have climbed from that in which he was stationed to the next, and might so have made his way for some distance. But as the wolves were watching him, and he could see as well by night as by day, there was no advantage in shifting his position. The day passed slowly. The wolves had for the most part withdrawn from beneath the tree, but a few kept their station there steadily. Malchus knew that the rest were lying beneath the bushes not far off, for he could hear their frequent snarling, and sometimes a grey head was thrust out and a pair of eager eyes looked hungrily towards him. From time to time Malchus listened breathlessly in hopes of hearing the distant shouts of his comrades, but all was still in the forest and he felt sure that the wolves would hear anyone approaching before he should. Once or twice, indeed, he fancied by their pricked ears and attitude of attention that they could hear sounds inaudible to him, but the alarm, if such it was, soon passed away, and it might have been that they were listening only to the distant footsteps of some stag passing through the forest. Night came again with its long, dreary hours. Malchus strapped himself by his belt to the tree to prevent himself from falling. In this way he managed to obtain a few hours of uneasy sleep, waking up each time with a start in a cold perspiration of fear, believing that he was falling into the hungry jaws below. In the morning a fierce desire to kill some of his foes seized him and he descended to the lowest branch. The wolves, seeing their prey so close at hand, thronged thickly under it and strove to leap up at him. Lying down on the bough and twisting his legs firmly under it to give him a purchase, Malchus thrust his sword nearly to the hilt between the jaws, 
which snapped fiercely as a wolf sprang to within a few inches of the bow. Several were killed in this way, and the rest, rendered cautious, withdrew to a short distance. Suddenly an idea struck Malchus. He took off his belt and formed it into a running noose, and then waited until the wolves should summon up courage to attack again. It was not long. Furious with hunger, which the prey they had always devoured, was only sufficient to wet, the wolves again approached and began to spring towards the bow. Malchus dropped the noose over the neck of one, and, with an effort, hauled it to the bow and dispatched it with his dagger. Then he moved along the bow and hung it on a branch some ten feet from the ground, slashing open with his dagger its chest and stomach. Having done this, he returned to his place. Six wolves were one after the other so hauled up and dispatched, and as Malchus expected, the smell of their blood rendered the pack more savage than ever. They assembled round the foot of the tree and continued to spring at the trunk, making vain endeavors to get at the supply of food which hung tantalizingly at so short a distance beyond their reach. So the day passed as before without signs of rescue. When it became dark, Malchus again descended to the lowest bough, and fired his three remaining arrows among the wolves below him. Loud howls followed each discharged, and the sound of a desperate struggle below. Then he tumbled the six dead wolves from their position to the ground below, and then as noiselessly as possible made his way along a bough into an adjoining tree. From this he passed into another till he had attained some distance from the spot where the wolves were fighting and growling over the remains of their companions far too absorbed in their work for any thought of him. Then he dropped noiselessly to the ground and fled at the top of his speed. It would be, he was sure, some time before the wolves had completed their feast, and even should they discover that he was missing from the tree, it would probably be some time before they could hit upon his scent, especially as, having just feasted on blood, their sense of smell would be dulled. Several times he stopped and listened in dread, lest he should hear the distant howl, which would tell him that the pack was again on his scent. All was quiet, save for the usual cries and noises in the forest. In two hours he saw a distant glow of light, and was soon in the encampment of his friends. End of section 6